Was the Challenger disaster preventable? Turns out it was, and one engineer's guilt haunted him for the rest of his life. It was supposed to be a pivotal point in NASA history and an inspiration for all Americans. Krista McAuliffe, a high school social studies teacher from New Hampshire, was to be the first civilian to fly into space. McAuliffe had recently won the Teacher in Space Project, a contest launched by President Ronald Reagan. The idea was that if McAuliffe, an average American, could travel to space, so could anyone else. Tragically, McAuliffe and the other six passengers never escaped the Earth's atmosphere. On January 28, 1986, the Space Shuttle Challenger lifted off from Cape Canaveral, Florida. 73 seconds later, the spacecraft was engulfed in flames. No one on board survived. As anyone who was alive at the time remembers, footage of the disaster was replayed over and over again on live TV. We have a report from the flight dynamics officer that the vehicle has exploded. The sad truth is that human error caused the disaster and cold weather. A presidential commission known as the Rogers Commission was launched to determine what went wrong and found that there had been a leak. The source of the leak was from something called an O-ring. Sensitive to extreme temperatures, the O-ring would lose its elasticity if exposed to temperatures under 53 degrees. On the January morning of the launch, the temperature was 36 degrees. Because of this, the rocket's combustion gases were able to leak through and ultimately cause structural damage. It was also determined that NASA and Morton Thiokol, the company that built the shuttle's rocket boosters, had brought up concerns about the O-rings before the launch. Somehow, the issue wasn't noted in the flight readiness documents. Bob Ebling was one of the engineers from Morton Thiokol who tried to stop the Challenger's launch outright. He and other engineers worried that the cold overnight temperatures before the launch would cause the O-rings to malfunction. Regardless of the data presented, both NASA and Thiokol executives refused to postpone the launch. Ebeline's daughter, Serna, accompanied him to the Thiokol complex that morning to watch the launch from the company's conference room. She later recalled to NPR, He said the Challenger is going to blow up, everyone's going to die, and he was beating his fist on the dashboard, he was frantic. After the cause of the disaster was found to be, quote, a serious flaw in the decision-making process leading up to the launch, one question remained. Why did NASA push for the launch? Perhaps unsurprisingly, it seems the answers have to do with both publicity and politics. The ultimate end goal for the Challenger was for it to usher in an era where space travel would be accessible to all. Then there was McCullough, a school teacher turned astronaut who became an instant celebrity and brought plenty of excitement and public awareness to the launch. I still can't believe that I'm going to actually be going into that shuttle. She was scheduled to broadcast a lesson live from space. If they launched later than intended, the broadcast would be on the weekend, when most children aren't in school. President Reagan was also slated to give his State of the Union address the day of the launch, which of course would be another big publicity win for both NASA and the President. Ultimately, it was a culmination of all these factors that led the launch to be that fateful cold January morning. If it would have been any other day that week, it's quite possible the disaster would not have occurred. After the Challenger disaster, it would be more than two years before NASA launched another shuttle mission. Moreover, Ebling, the engineer who tried to stop the Challenger launch, lived with the guilt of not being able to do more. Before his death in 2016, he told NPR, I think that was one of the mistakes God made. He shouldn't have picked me for that job.